All right, good morning, everybody. I'm live here from the Bird House, and today we are joined by a very special guest. You probably uh, know him one way or another. You probably have one of his books on your bookshelf. This is Stan Tequila, who's the author of Birds of New York, is joining us today. Not only is he the author of this book, but hundreds of other field guides. And I'd like to give a warm welcome to Stan this morning. Um, if you are online, you can throw your questions or comments for Stan right in the comments, or you can just say hello as well. So good morning, Stan. How's it going? Hi, Liz. Uh, <laughs> things are going really good. And it's so good to see you too. Good. And today, actually, we are raffling off a signed copy of Stan's, uh, one of Stan's newest books. I think this is one of your newest books. Um, yes. It's, it's new-ish. I don't know how many more you've come out with since this one, um, but you can enter to win this for free just in the comments if you put the hashtag, put hashtag book, and that's all you'll need to do, and we'll do a random drawing for it at the end of the broadcast. So, um, so what's new with you, Stan? It sounds like there's a lot of things new with you recently. Oh, yeah. I've uh, been doing a lot of, uh, oh, I see people are already coming into the chat, which is good. I, I like to see that. <laughs> so, hey, I'm going to give a quick uh, shout out to everybody there and figure out if I can how to do this here. Uh, connect YouTube account. No, I don't want to do that. Why can't I uh, contribute to the chat? Do you see um, on the right hand side, is there something that says comments? Comments? Yes. Yeah. You click yeah. comments, you should be able to see the comments, and then at the bottom, post. Yeah, nope. Nope. No. Nope. I'll see if I can switch your settings. Hang on, see if I can join the chat. Well, anyhow, I was, I was hoping to be able to chat back with people. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, I've been pretty busy. Uh, the fall was a busy time of year. I was out um, scouting a few extra areas in order to lead some photo tours to. I don't know, Liz, if you know that um, I also do uh, photography tours. So people travel with me to different parts of the world to photograph different wildlife. And I was up in Churchill, Manitoba. I've, I've been there before. And uh, so I was back to um, check it out and see you know, the opportunities that could be available to go and had an opportunity to photograph uh, a number of uh, amazing animals. Uh, polar bears in particular was what I was there for. And then in addition to that, I also had a chance to photograph um, beluga whales underwater, which is what, what an amazing experience there. We were in a small uh, Zodiac and I was hanging over the side of the boat uh, with my um, action camera on a uh, like a selfie stick and down into the water. Oh my and, gosh! Uh, and photographing it was uh, it was really something too. So um, so that was fun. Uh, had a good time there. And um, uh, I, it was it was one of those things where I don't know. I felt like it was such a t touching moment seeing these beluga whales. They come right up to the boat. And um, I'm trying to I'm trying to post one, but it keeps telling me invalid um, file type. So I guess I'll give up on that. Um, the 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 blugas are first of all, blugas are a toothed whale, so they are um, they're not one of the large um, baleen whales. Those are the whales that filter out uh, microorganisms in the water. These are toothed whales, and they they eat other fish and such. And uh, they would come right up to the boat within two feet. And um, like I said, I'm hanging over the edge of this boat and um, trying to uh, uh, get, you know, position my action camera in place so I can catch some uh, pictures and video of them underwater. And they, uh, uh, they would come right up to it. In fact, at one point, they took the, my action camera, put it in their mouth. <laughs> oh my God. And they could easily just rip it to shreds, but they don't. They're just kind of, you know, kind of mouthing it and seeing what is this type of thing. And that was kind of cool. And um, so, and they just look at you, they just turn and their eye, you just eye to eye, you're, they're just looking at you. And it's what a, I don't know, it just kind of reaches right into your soul and touches you. And, you know, I'm a grown man and I'm, you know, <laughs> weeping over the side of the boat with this uh, this contact, this interpersonal contact with these whales. It was absolutely amazing. That's so, so neat. Yeah, it was really a 
really an amazing time uh, to be able to do that. Of course, now and then I get my hands down in the water and it's darn cold water. And mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was just a, a great experience. And uh, hopefully to be um, leading some of those tours back up to that area in the near future in 2024 and 2025. Because you you usually do it's all terrestrial photography, really, right? Like you don't do that much underwater photography. Is that right? right. Might be a new thing for you, right? Exactly. And so <laughs> I'm. Uh, uh, it's kind of a different technique too, because what you're doing is doing video, and then you're pulling uh, still images off of that. And um, I wish the uh, what is live stream here would uh, support the <clears throat> file formats. Um, as I'd like to, sh I could show you some of those uh, images here because when it goes, when I go to it, it says here it'll support Google Slides, uh, PowerPoint, and PDF. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem to support uh, JPEGs. So. Hmm. Oh, weird. Um, if you email them over, I might be able to share them. Well, if I, yeah, maybe well, I could try that. Meanwhile, uh, I'll try to keep keep talking to about it here uh let's see if i can find uh so you've are. done uh recently you did a book on bears of north america that we have yeah. here too so you're doing a separate book on polar bears is that the um yeah i'm i'm mainly see if this works i'm gonna send this to you see if that gets to you um uh, mainly i'm uh scouting for a future trips to be able to take people there uh i just did finish up the uh bear book uh did you have did you hold up a copy i didn't see if you had that uh, yes like i've got this one yeah yeah and so that's the the newest of my bear books right now and that one covers <laughs> all the black bears brown bears and polar bears and um so it's a uh kind of captures all those things too but of course you know how that goes you put out these new you put out a new book and then shortly after that i i capture some of the best images ever of bears you know or whatever it is i'll have a new book on whatever it may be and um you know oh there you go here's so, one yeah here's here's the belugas yeah. isn't that something so that I mean, was taken from from the boat under the water yeah, that was me hanging over the boat with the camera down in the water. And um, it was absolutely uh, kind of an amazing uh, time. I'll see if I can send you another one here. Uh, How many? So it must have been a big, is it a pod? A big pod of? Yeah, they they go in families is what they do. Um, and the families, uh, they tend to be fairly, fairly, they can be anywhere from six to 12, you know, sometimes higher uh, numbers. But they're a... Uh, uh, they're a social whale, and uh, I'm going to try to find this uh, so I can send more to you here. One second, here, and I'll, I'll get some good things over to you. It'd be kind of fun to um, uh, show these. I'm sure everybody will be it'll be worth the wait to see them, hopefully. And so, so um, as far as signing up to some of these photo tours, is that on your your website on the Nature Smart uh, website? Yes. That's yeah. Yep. Yeah, they are there, and um, I'll have. I'll be I'll be putting more up there uh, in the very near future. Mm -hmm. uh, more trips coming up because um, I'll give you a a, um, a a preview. I guess it is in that I'll be doing a trip in 2025, which is a ways off, of course. But I'll be doing a, a trip down to the Galapagos Islands also. Oh, neat! Oh, yeah. that will be really cool. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about that one. That should be a lot of fun. Um, so I'm sending you over two more pictures that you can uh, that you can share with the group there. Awesome. Um, yeah, I know you do what loons and do you do a wolf one? I'm trying to remember. Bears, black bears. Black bears. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So um, so I'll do a black bear uh, trip in the spring and in the fall every year. Every June I do uh, loon tours. That those are based here in Minnesota. Uh, where I'm at, and uh, we go out and we everybody's looking to capture pictures of loons uh, with the babies riding on their backs, and that's the objective, and that's why I go out in the month of June for that. So it's really kind of a, a fun. Uh, everyone seems to really love enjoy that uh, the mm -hmm. tour. So, and I sent you over another uh, beluga whale shot, and also yeah. a uh, one polar bear shot. I think maybe uh, if you bring those up when you get a chance. Yes, I have them. They're awesome. Okay, let's see here. Oh, that's the old one. Okay. And 
I love this one. <laughs> this one's cool. Oh, yeah. So that's okay. another beluga. And then you've got... It's finally letting me uh, post some comments, so that's good. Oh, good. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, looks like we've got some people on here trying to win the book. You can put the hashtag book into the comments. And um, at the end, we will uh, we'll do a drawing, and we'll mm -hmm. get that book to you. So of the New Owls book. Here's a, there here's you a go. polar bear right there. Yeah. What a great uh, experience uh, these bears are. Uh, of course, polar bears are the largest land predator in the world. They um, Males can run 1,500 to 2,000 pounds, very big animals who their main prey are whales and seals. So they're a marine bear. And they, uh, you know, seals are, you know, five feet you know, long, about 150 pounds or 200 pounds type of thing. And, uh, of course, people are about the same size. And so the polar bears, they see people, they, you know, that's about the same size prey that they normally go after. And so the bears are always very uh, inquisitive and very uh, playful. They they uh, basically, anytime they see you, they start heading right for you because, you know, they're opportunistic. They're looking for an opportunity in which they can possibly do something to, you know, kind of check things out. And so the bears are always coming at you. And I and I always found that uh, very fascinating because they walk at you kind of like, oh, yeah, no big deal. And they're like looking around here and there. And they give you that sideways look, you know, they're kind of looking at you sideways. Like they're not really looking at you, but they are mm -hmm. and they're checking you out. And they just, they will do anything just to get as close as they possibly can to you. And then they'll kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> So I have to have when when doing this, we have an armed uh, guide with us who has um, you know a, a, a shotgun, uh, has a, a variety of things, bear spray, has you know uh, flares and a variety of different uh, bear deterrents that to help uh, you know keep us safe and because you don't want these bears near you, it just is not you know a smart thing to do and um and but they they want to come and check you out so it's really imperative to have somebody like that uh be with you at all times to make sure you've got some safety uh with it so and then with with the polar bears i know like i heard um like grizzly bears and things like they eat a lot of worms and they'll eat other things instead of just like you know the the bigger they'll eat moths yeah grizzly bear yeah brown bears eat everything uh they're true omnivores <laughs> in that they'll they'll have everything from insects to uh plants to fish uh small mammals uh i've watched grizzly bears dig uh you know ground squirrels out of the ground and and eat them uh so there's there's all sorts of uh, uh things but polar bears are not that uh kind of wide ranging in their mm. in their uh and they don't eat a lot of they're mainly carnivores so they're not eating a lot of uh, plants. Uh, black bears and brown bears, especially black bears, the vast majority of their diet is plants. So uh, very, very different uh, there. And uh, polar bears also, and you think about this too, how different brown bears, black bears, and polar bears are. Black bears and brown bears all hibernate in the wintertime. Polar bears, on the other hand, they are the most active in the winter time, mm -hmm. just the absolute opposite of the, uh, they used to say that polar bears, um, did kind of like a, what they call a walking hibernation in the summertime because they weren't eating much because there's no, they couldn't catch any seal. But what they found now is that the uh, polar bears are, are finding dead whales and things like that. And they're scavenging and they're, you know, just anything that they can. They also eat, uh, any kind of berries that they can find. But uh, a lot of people estimate that the energy it takes to uh, find those uh, berries and eat them is actually a negative calorie loss uh, for it when they're when they're feeding on bear, uh, you know small berries and things like that. These are large, large animals. Uh, they're the size of a small car, and they are very impressive when they when you are on the ground and you're looking at them. Uh, you know, you feel it. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, it's like, oh boy, look at that. You know, so yeah, they're they're really something else. So do they go through, do you know, do they go through any kind of periods where they are a little bit um, slower, not a true hibernation, but they not, not at all? No, no, they're, they're very active. They'll sleep for days on end though. Uh, and that's just, you know, cause they're, 
they're basically there's nothing to eat there's nothing to do they're just waiting for the ice to form and that's probably the big thing there and you know we're um you know we're seeing the climate changing and um uh believe it or not there's actually still some people who deny climate change which is just mind-boggling to me but at any rate um uh, the the climate changing these bears are a good example of what is changing and shifting for these bears so because they rely on sea ice uh, to get out onto the ocean where the seals are at seals are marine mammals mammals breathe air and as the ice forms those seals need to maintain an air hole so it's a fairly, you know, it's a large air hole that they have to come up through to breathe and then go back down into the water. And um, they have to maintain that all winter long. The seals have to maintain this air hole all winter long. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, they're going to die. They're going to suffocate. Uh, they can't breathe. And so the polar bears take advantage of this by going out on the ice and hunting the seals that come up for air. Mm -hmm. And um, And so... Uh, they are very active in the wintertime, but when the ice doesn't form for about two to three weeks now, um, late, uh, the ice forms two to three weeks later than it normally did, and the ice goes out two to three weeks before it did before, you're talking about a full month's worth of time hunting seal that they can't do because, they're, uh, because the ice isn't forming or it breaks up too soon. So it's a, it's a real... Uh, uh, change for these uh, types of animals. Our climate changing so much that uh, these animals are really kind of on the, the spearhead of all these changes, and they are going to be the one taking uh, some of the first rounds of, um, of you know, I don't, I don't know what you'd say, you know, first rounds of extinction. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, animals like this, or pika, or lots of different animals that rely on uh, colder weather uh, to survive uh, are going to really have a problem. Did you see any signs there's there, every once in a while you see like photos online or you you read the articles about this, about the diminishing sea ice and you see the pictures of, you know, the polar bears that are very thin and you can see their ribs and all that. Did, did you see that or did the guides have anything to say about you well, know, the size of the bears changing over time that they've seen? Yeah, the, the I was in I was on the Hudson Bay uh, in Canada um, and in uh they say that in that population, it's a subpopulation of polar bears. They normally have about 800 bears. They're down to about 600. So they've lost a, you know, a, a percentage of them, a quarter of them are already gone. So uh, there are changes happening. And uh, although you can still see, you know, mothers with cubs and uh, you still see the big males and things like that, there's, there's still there and they're still doing things. It's just, it's a, um, uh, you know, it's an obvious change that you can see and all you know the other thing that was really kind of interesting i'll, I'll try to send you this one here too uh, and, and you'll see why you why it's a problem um when you see the picture so give me one second here and you and you'll see this picture um why it's a problem for these for these guys one second um you, you, you're gonna like this it's um here we go it's on its way to you. Uh, tell me what what you think is the problem with this picture here, and what, okay. the change, the changing climate, and what, what. See what you think on this one. It's pretty good. You you'll like it there. Okay, let's see. It just came in. So let's see. We do have um, <clears throat> a comment here from Ed. Had a comment about the whales too. Mm -hmm. About a book he's recommending about. Uh, about whales in general, which sounds very, very interesting. Yes, yeah. Whales are amazing, absolutely amazing. So, okay. Here we go. So, this is an Arctic hare. They turn white in the wintertime. <laughs> <laughs> and this was um, taken in the winter, I take yeah, it. <laughs> yes. So, this is the tundra, uh, and there's no snow. And so, um, it's a little hard to blend in when you're white and everything else isn't. Uh, so you can you can see the changes there. So these animals uh, change based on the amount of uh, daylight. It's called the photo period. So the amount of time the sun is up from sunrise to sunset is what kind of changes the hormones in this animal's bodies to be able to uh, switch over to growing these 
a, a coat. It's called a pelage of white fur. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're, you know, the, the, the daylight hasn't changed. The climate has changed and the weather's changing with it. And so uh, they're used to a time in which, well, you know, at this time of year when the daylight is this long, we need to change. Well, now they're changing and look what's happening. So um, very, very interesting. I thought that was kind of a funny um, thing. Enough. I, I, and these hairs are quite large, uh, by the way. Hairs are very, just if we can kind of diverge a little sure. bit from it, mm -hmm. hares and rabbits are very different. Uh, rabbits we're pretty much all familiar with. You must, most people are familiar with the Eastern cottontail rabbit. Uh, rabbits and hares are different from each other in a number of different ways. And one of them is right here. It's very obvious. The uh, rabbits do not change color in the wintertime. Hares do. Rabbits, when they give birth to babies, their babies are born blind, naked, and helpless and need to be taken care of by their mother for a while. Hair babies are born with fur, eyes open, and are uh, able to move around right away. Uh, there's some differences in the structure of their teeth. There's a variety of different uh, things that really distinguish them uh, apart from each other. And hairs obviously change color uh, in the wintertime. So uh, I think most people could be familiar with the snowshoe hair. This is the Arctic hair, so it's its uh, cousin, basically. Um, and it's bigger than the snowshoe hair also. Um, but we have other things like jack rabbits. You, I've, I'm sure you've heard of jack rabbits, but jack rabbits are not a rabbit; they're a type of hare because jack rabbits change colors also. So our common names kind of mess people up a little bit here, and um, they don't help when we're trying to learn these things at all. Right. I guess a good example maybe of an animal that turns white like this, like around in our neck of the woods would be like the ermines, the little weasels. Yes. And things yeah. Short tail like weasels. Like, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, short tail weasels are another one like that uh, that changes in the wintertime. And uh, I find that very fascinating because the short tail weasels down in the southern states don't change colors, but the ones in the northern states oh, do. Okay. I find that fascinating too. As a biologist, I kind of look at those types of things and scratch my head and go, now that's, that's interesting because they're adapting yeah. to their habitats, they're adapting to the places that they're at. Yeah, it's so it's almost like the same thing with the um, we get the the red F stage of the yeah. red spotted newt too, yes. like up in yes. the Adirondacks oh, wow. and things. You can find those, and not every they don't always turn into that stage. So that's always like really cool to see. Wow, cool too. for you to know that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, we we get those here, and it's um it's like a it's a for those that don't know what I'm talking about, it's like it's a little salamander, and sometimes they're fully aquatic and they just turn into their newt stage, and then um, sometimes they live on the land for a little bit before turning mm -hmm. into a newt. It's really, mm -hmm. it's really cool. Yeah, that is uh, when you get into the world of reptiles and amphibians, you are literally in a different world because they. They are so different from all the other, you know, I mean, we as people, we're a type of mammal and we can identify with other types of mammals. And we oftentimes kind of make the mistake of um, associating our mammalian type of ways over to, um, you know, uh, birds. But uh, we're almost always, you know, going to be wrong in those situations. So it's, it's interesting when you start looking at reptiles and amphibians. Wow, it is a different world completely. There's and the pica. There's the pica. You mentioned the pica earlier as being mm -hmm. susceptible to climate change. So I thought I'd pull up a little picture from your website. This is from your Nature yeah. Smart uh, website of yeah. the pica. Mm -hmm. Yep. I like pikas. They are, believe it or not, they are the <laughs> only closely related animal to the pica is the rabbit. Uh, <laughs> so it's interesting you should mention that. And these guys are um, uh, high elevation small mammal that uh, stores food for winter. It does not hibernate. And uh, they are probably one of the most adorable, cute little critters you've ever seen. <laughs> they just are amazing. And they run around. You can see this this picture here. You can see that they have a, uh, a mouthful of, uh, of uh, plants. They go out, they take all these plants, they collect them up, they bring them back, they actually lay them in the sun dry them out in the sun, and then they gather them back up and bring them back into their den for the wintertime. So they have this, it's called like a dried hay for the wintertime that they feed on during the wintertime. Because in, up in the mountains, they get, you know, feet and feet of snow on top of them. And so they don't come out at all. They stay under in the dark and they're feeding on this, uh, uh, on their hay that they stored from the uh, summertime. Very industrious and very uh, cool critters. They really, truly are. 
How cool. How yeah. neat. We have two different types of pica. We have the American pica, which is this picture here. Mm -hmm. And in Alaska, there's a collared pica. Uh, oh, so these, cool. these guys are about the size of a, I don't know, maybe a large baked potato. They're not, you know, they're, they're, they're not, <laughs> not maybe about smaller, much smaller than a rabbit, but, you know, bigger than a mouse type of thing. Mm -hmm. Have fun. <laughs> and so it looks like you've got um, sort of, got not only the bird books which we're all familiar with but the the mammal books too which is which is yes. really cool and yeah. so what other um what other photo tours do you do you said the the loon ones and loon then in june the, the I, black do West, I do western grebes in may so people can come and photograph western grebes now western grebes are the ones that run on the surface of the water mm -hmm. um let's see if i can maybe find one of those you can look for <laughs> one too on my website and i'll uh, i'll try to send you one here um so at the same time so yeah there's a there's a bunch of youtube videos usually of them yes. kind of like dancing on the water together yeah, yeah it's a... called it's called rushing when they do that um and they are they are really impressive um when they, when they do that i remember seeing these guys as um a, a, as a kid watching uh, walt disney back in the 60s yeah. and um i was absolutely fascinated by them I thought, what you know, what an amazing uh, uh, animal. I'm having problems finding one for you here. I'm sorry about that. Let me see if I can find another. I've got um, one up from your site, but it's it's kind of small of them, kind of dancing. And it's just it's the male. It's just yeah. the males that do the, the um, dance, if you will. Well, it's males and females. They they both do it, and it's uh, some people believe it's uh, courtship. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, like pair bonds and things like that. But it's very interesting because they come together and they're very um, aggressive towards each other at first. And then all of a sudden they'll kind of come, come, come together and they'll do this little head wag. And then they'll stand up on the water like that and rush on the water. And they are literally running on the surface of the water to do that. And I, that is very impressive How uh, cool. when they do something like that. Yeah. And I remember seeing that, like I said, as a kid, uh, Disney had um, kind of a, a short snippet of uh, video where they had these uh, Western Greaves running on the water to, and it was set to classical music. And I remember seeing that as a kid thinking, I, I really want to see that, that, you know, that was really something I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, I'm able to do that uh, later in life and uh, lead tours of that in, in May. So that's kind of cool. Is, it, is that the only grebe species that does this kind of a thing? Does the rushing? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I mm -hmm. believe so. They Others do a variety of different um, type of um, elaborate displays and things like that, but they're mm -hmm. not well, like the rushing part like you're used to seeing there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm still trying to find one, darn it. I still can't find one for you. I'm really sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do the grieve tours, the loon tours. You've got black bear. Yeah, I do a variety of tours for other companies. Um, so I do a tour to Costa Rica. I do a tour to all um, uh, Florida. And I've, I've got one of my own tours coming up here in February to Alaska for uh, bald eagles and um, for... Um, sea otters uh so that's oh, a yeah yeah that's a that's really a, a fun trip because i'll see if i can find one here for you um they the bald eagles are are absolutely amazing i'll send you here's a do you get puffins on that trip too i no we don't because the puffins are migratory and they and they leave <laughs> so i sent you another picture there hopefully you'll uh you'll get that one too um, yeah, we've got your bald eagle book here too. This is a, a newish one, also. The yes, bald eagle ultimate raptors. We've got those in stock, also. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, my phone is blowing up right now. Um, it is my birthday today, so I'm it's your birthday. Oh yeah. my gosh, happy birthday! Yeah, so I'm uh, my phone's blowing up right now with all sorts of people. <laughs> oh my like gosh, that. I bet. Mm -hmm. Everybody's so, wishing you happy birthday on all yeah, your mm -hmm. forms of social media and on your. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's see yep. this picture you just sent here, too. There you go. Yeah, so those are the types of pictures we do on the on the Bald Eagle tour. Um, and then, uh, uh, like I said, um, 
forget what's the question here. What do you do? Oh, what do you find in uh, Costa Rica? Oh my gosh, I'll I'll try to send you a few pictures here um, for uh, Costa Rica birds. Yeah, how uh, many days of like on a trip like that? How many days are you down there for? It's usually ten days, and yeah. my oh my, the bird life is just off the hooks. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's one of those things where um your mind spins from the variety of different things now here we here we are in the eastern united states we have one species of hummingbird one <laughs> and you go down there and like costa rica has like 90 species of hummingbirds so depending on what elevation you're at on the mountainsides you can get different um uh, species of hummingbird that that i find absolutely amazing um, and I just love hummingbirds. Anybody who knows me knows I'm kind of have a fascination with the, with the hummingbirds. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, that's really something too. So, uh, I'm not really, we're, yeah, we've got some of your hummingbird, got this one too, your hummingbirds book. This is a, a newer version. Yes. A newer mm -hmm. hummingbird book. We've had some of your old other ones in. This is the, the newest one we have in from you. Marvels of the bird world. The yeah. And they truly are. When you want to look at a bird that's unique from all other birds, different from all other birds, the hummingbirds are really it. They are so different in so many different ways. Everything from obviously their size, but the way they fly, the anatomical structure of their body is very different from other birds also. Um, you know, 25% of the bird's entire body weight is just its pectoral muscle in its chest that helps them to fly um and that's amazing in itself there uh and they're the only birds who can actually truly hover mm -hmm. who can fly upside down backwards and things like that these birds are really unique they truly are and it's it's rare but every once in a while we get a report of a rufus hummingbird yes, around yeah. is that I've, I've heard that that's kind of happening not just here it happens like here and there they seem to be if one is expanding its range east it definitely right. seems to be the rufus that's making appearances here and there yes and you always get these oddballs that show up we had i'm in minnesota and we had a juvenile uh, anna's hummingbird uh here oh, this fall okay uh mm -hmm. how <laughs> how interesting is that you know but you're always going to have those um kind of outliers those um uh, individuals that show up in different areas that probably shouldn't be there. So uh, that's, and that's fairly common. And then as people, of course, what do we do? We want to uh, jump in to rescue them. And um, it, when chances are, they probably have a defective um, navigational system and, uh, it, you know, and they're, uh, you know, perhaps uh, they should be called from nature because of their, um, you know, uh, not, operating correctly you know right. I'm, I'm trying to put it nicely yeah you know? <laughs> there's something a there's little something definitely wrong with them yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah a good example of that locally for us is um mm -hmm. last week maybe a couple weeks ago we had a purple gallinule that was hanging yes. around yeah so that was that set and did you guys get any of the uh the flamingos that came up there was like a over a dozen flamingos that showed up all over there was some in wisconsin and um they we came up after that one big storm so. we didn't have any flamingos this year but we had spoonbill uh maybe a couple years ago yeah um that was showing up in our uh one of our local refuges um mm -hmm. we had one year where there's all these r random things it might have even been 2020 or 2021 mm -hmm. and it was like are these things happening more than we know it or are there just more eyeballs on it now because everything was closed and you know, the, the only thing people were could do is really be outside. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, we, we've had some interesting things around. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That kind of, uh, that's one of my favorite books of yours actually is your migration book where it shows where oh, it talks yeah. about all the different types of migration. And, um, it, it, cause we talk about, you know, migration all the time and how mm -hmm. not, not everything flies all the way down to South America or Central America. Some things just go a little bit further South. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting all how everything is adapted in different ways over time to survive. Yeah. When you talk about fun things uh, to write about, migration. I, I love migration. It is such a, a very <laughs> in-depth and detailed um, kind of phenomenon that happens. 40% of all the birds in the world do some kind of migration, and uh, which is almost half. And so it's, um, you know, migration is probably when we think of migration we think of the big long you know migrations back and forth they can be long they can be short 
But either way, migration is always the most arduous, most difficult, the most dangerous thing that a bird can do every single year. And a lot of birds die during the migration process. And so you got to ask yourself, is it uh, worth it? And, um, you know, obviously, as a biologist, you know, you look at these types of cost benefit analysis and clearly the benefits outweigh the costs. Otherwise, these birds would have evolved away from migration a long time ago and would not be continuing to do it today. So migration is uh, is worth it, but it is, again, one of the most dangerous and most arduous, most difficult things that a bird will do at any time. Yeah, it's pretty wild to think about. I mean, talking about hummingbirds, how those hummingbirds are so, so tiny. <laughs> and there must be so many things that could sweep them off course and, yes. and probably do, but it's yes. amazing that they can make that yeah. migration and every so year. And that's, a, and that's a good point because they're so tiny and then people just look at them and they immediately assume that there's no possible way they could go this far and migrate and find their way, so on and so forth. And so, believe it or not, in the early uh, 1900s, uh, uh, it was generally believed that these birds couldn't migrate. And so therefore we started making up things for them. And that's where the, uh, notion of, uh, hummingbirds riding on the backs of geese, uh, came about because we just couldn't conceive the fact that, that how could these tiny birds actually migrate this far? And, uh, of course, once again, we were wrong and, uh, they, uh, Obviously, they don't migrate in the backs of geese, but I still hear people saying that on a regular basis that, you know, that's how they do it, which is funny because, our, you know, our geese don't really migrate very far and the hummingbirds migrate all the way down to the tropics. Uh, so, you know, it's when you know a little bit more about it, it seems painfully obvious that this isn't even, you know, uh, possible. By the way, in the uh, 1800s, early 1800s, uh, when birds migrated, a lot of people believe that they like dove to the bottom of ponds and lakes and overwintered in the mud at the bottoms of lakes. Can you imagine that? A bird going to the bottom of a lake and then uh, spending the entire winter down there and then coming back up. <laughs> so uh, we didn't understand. And so therefore, again, as people, what we do is we, tr we make up things for them. Uh, and that is the problem with a lot of different species, uh, in particular nocturnal species, species that are out at night. And they, uh, because we don't understand them, we don't know them, we make up things about them. And, mm -hmm. um, but when you, uh, when you start to understand them, then you kind of, to me, that's where the, oh, wow, uh, factor comes in. Uh, like some amazing stuff that these, uh, birds and animals have done. Uh, you gotta think about it this way. We as people have been around for, you know, tens of thousands of years, okay? Uh, but birds have been around, the modern birds, the birds that are around us to this day, have been around for millions of years and long before people came about. And uh, we, you know, and yet we still sit and think about, oh, they can't do this or they can't do that, when in fact for millions of years they've been doing it. So we have to kind of adjust our thinking a little bit and and think about it in a more biological sense and you'll you'll things will become a little more clear to you yeah and we're excited because not only are we giving out um, we're raffling off one of your signed copies of your book but actually we uh, have uh, plans for Stan to come into the Rochester area to give his talk about owls next year. So we're really uh, excited about that. So make sure to mark your calendars because we do have Stan coming into town Friday, April 12th of 2024. And so Yay! So make sure to mark your calendars because he'll be here and we're excited to have him back. He's been here a couple of times and um, we're super excited to hear his talk on owls and they have so so many neat adaptations as far as being able to hunt and thrive in the dark so excited about that also so we've got lots of stuff going on here so yeah your owls book is pretty cool um do you have people probably ask you all the time but do you have like a favorite type of owl um not really. I like all uh, birds. I've yet to meet a bird that I didn't love. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's one of those things where, um, I don't know, I, I they all have their own unique um, things if, about them that I find. I, I, I'm actually impressed even with things like, uh, you know, American robins and things like that. I, I like them. Uh, I like all birds because they are... The things that they do are so unique 
and so unusual mm -hmm. that um, I'm going to send you a new a new picture of something I've been working on just in the last couple of weeks. So I okay. just sent that to you. Um, any kind of even a common bird, I'm okay with. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's there's that whole thing about you know native and non-native birds and things like that, and that is a whole different can of worms. And again, I have yet to meet a bird that I didn't actually think was you know pretty darn cool. So um, uh, for me, when you when uh, when you look at owls. Yeah, I think northern, I think winter, I think, you know, but then again, there's so many southern owls, too. Uh, these the owls have adapted into uh, just about any type of habitat uh, all over the place. But again, they are one of those nighttime nocturnal uh, critters that uh, people find absolutely fascinating. And that leads right to this. This is a southern Ooh. flying squirrel. And they're a nocturnal animal also. Uh, just like the owls, and I've been uh, last couple of weeks here working on a project to photograph uh, flying squirrels too. So um, now these squirrels are very common. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you have them in the Rochester, New York area. We do. Uh, People yeah. get them at their bird feeders at night sometimes. I think yes. I think Ed gets them. Who's on here? Um, who's who's been commenting a bit? I think he's had he's sent in pictures of them. But yeah, yeah we've got them around. <laughs> they are so small; they will fit in the palm of your hand. These are uh, little tiny squirrels, and yet they have so much energy, and they are so they're fearless. Uh, and you have to be fearless to be that small and to be not being able to fly you just glide and i watch my squirrels they'll come down to my feeder which i have attached to an oak tree they will grab a peanut climb to the top of this 60 to 80 foot tall uh, oak tree in the dark <laughs> and then just leap off just jump right off the branch and out comes their you know and they glide over the top of my house into the backyard and um, I'm always just shocked by this because, I mean, what uh, audacity do you have to <laughs> be able to just leap off of a 80 foot tall tree when you're this big, you know, and then and then have the confidence to be able to glide through the dark and then land where you need to land. And I, I just I find that absolutely amazing. Maybe that's part of the reason why I really enjoy these flying squirrels is because they seem to be breaking all the rules of what, you know, what we kind of put out for them. I, I just think they're amazing. I really do. So. Do you have any tips for people who want to do photography like this, like nocturnal photography? Do you, um, are there Good. certain yeah. uh, filters or like lenses you use or anything like that? All I can say is good luck. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Cross your fingers. <laughs> oh my, this is the hardest thing to do because you're working in the dark. Mm -hmm. You're working with a, you don't know where they're coming from and how they're yeah. coming in and all that. It is so hard. It is really, really difficult. Uh, last night I was trying to set up a camera just to do some video of these guys. And I was trying to figure out different camera angles and ways to do that. And in order to capture a wide enough, big enough area to catch a flying squirrel coming through it, you have to be pretty wide but then that means that the flying squirrel is this little tiny thing going right through the frame and like that. So it's really, really hard. Um, so, and then you have to have flashes for still photography. You have to have flashes and, but for video, you can just use lights. So um, I, I just, I find all nature fascinating. Flying squirrels are one of my passions. I just absolutely love these guys. They are so cool and uh, they're around and people don't even realize that they're around. And I, I think that's pretty neat. Yeah, what's the best way? Are there certain signs that they leave? I, I think I've heard they there's a certain noise they make that I oh, yeah. feel like I've heard before, but it's a high pitched um squeak, kind of like a really loud mouse, if you will. And they are very vocal. These guys talk a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got a couple that come into my feeder and they just come in and for whatever reason, I was laughing at them last night, they'll come in and they'll grab a peanut. And for whatever reason, they're running up the tree, just chattering away with this high-pitched, squeaky little noise. And it's like, you, you don't have to do that, but they do it anyhow. They're just like, I don't know if they're talking to everybody and telling everybody about the great peanut that they've got or, or just what it is. But I I just laughed at that last night. It was like, you know, dude, you don't have to do that. But there he is. He's making his, you know, <laughs> announcing his exit for, with the peanut. 
so yeah, you can hear them. Um, the best way to do something like this is to uh, uh, put out some food for them at night. And that's the trick there. If you put it out there in the day, you say goodbye. Oh, I mean, the gray squirrels are going to get it. The red squirrels are going to get it. The blue jays, everybody else is going to get it. And by nighttime, it's all gone. So you have to put out the food at night. And then if you want to... Um, uh, an easy way to do it would be just to put a trail camera on there to watch, to capture images of whatever's coming in at night. Now, having said that, I, I'm going to see if I can try to show you this. It, it may, I don't know how well it's going to translate uh, here, but I've got, um, I don't know if you're going to be able to see that. Yeah, I know the brightness comes in. Let me see if I can do this. Oh, yeah, that's like your feeder setup. It that's my feeder, and that's a live video camera of my uh, – that's a live video uh, feed of my squirrel feeder. So I have a video camera on it, and I can, wa I can watch them that way too. And then it captures all the individual events that happen. Um, and that is – and that's kind of fun uh, because you can, you can do that. Here's a – let me see if I can play this for you here. Um, oh yeah oh my gosh there they are yeah i'm not trying to i'm gonna get this the best way i'm sorry but you can see if there's two of yeah. them there you can see their big eyes yeah and, <laughs> uh, yeah it's so bright that it's it's blowing out i'm sorry about that i don't know if there's a way to do oh, that how neat there that's a little bit better huh so there. there's now you can see on a, on a tree a, like an i just put it on i just yeah tacked it to a, a my oak tree in my front yard and um so it's just kind of fun to see um, and then here's a, uh, you'll like this here. There's a still picture. Again, I apologize. I should, I should have had this all ready for you guys to be able to have it online, but one second here, you'll see. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. There's <laughs> four like of them. Above. Yeah. Yeah. There's four of them. Oh and they, that's another reason why I love flying squirrels because they're very social like that. And they're always a family group and things, which is really fun. Oh, so, neat. yeah, I, you know, so for me, I birds are like at the center of the universe, but all the other wildlife is 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 there too. But you know, uh, you don't have to just feed the the birds in your yard. You can feed the flying squirrels too, mm -hmm. things like that. So, have you ever tried any like bat photography or anything like that with the nocturnal? I have. Mm -hmm. I've done a I've done a lot of bat photography actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that is a uh, fun really fun thing to do um i'll bet you i can find one here fairly quick for you too um because they um here i got one right here for you check this out i don't know if you'll be able to see it but um oh yeah it's drinking from a flower that's yeah awesome. yeah that's a bat from a flower that's that's in costa rica uh, again another one they have do they have they have those big like flying foxes down there those really big bats do they uh they do but um uh, the, they don't come into uh, like flowers uh, to pollinate and things like that. Mm, so they, they like fruits and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, and there's just an example. Oh, of the stuff, there it is. You know, toucans, toucans. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Costa Rica is like, wow, what a place, you know. it's. It, and then, you know, um, there's all sorts of things like uh, there's a. Um, like a snake? It's an eyelash viper. Oh, okay. So, yep. Yeah. Be careful of these guys. Stay away. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. If anybody has any questions for Stan, go ahead and put those in the comments. You've got a, just a little bit more time too, to put that hashtag in there to win your, uh, to be able to win a book. So just put hashtag book into the comments that'll enter you into the contest and we'll do a random drawing. Um, and just a little bit here to see who wins that book but yeah if you have any questions absolutely throw those in the comments for stan um what time of the year do you do that costa rica trip um it's usually no uh beginning uh, end of november beginning of december usually oh, i'm there okay. usually i'm there right now mm -hmm. um i'm usually there actually over my birthday and um but this year's trip was pushed back but in 2024 i'll be uh again I'll be down there for my birthday. A year, a year from now. Yeah. And mm -hmm. to sign up for those 
the best way is to go to your website, the Nature Smart. Yeah. Um, yeah, naturesmart.com is going to have the trips that I offer through my company. I also work for a couple other companies uh, that also offer trips. If people are interested in a, a kind of an intensive photography one and you want to plan for it, I'll be doing a uh, trip to the Galapagos in, um, yeah, I believe it's, uh, boy, oh boy, um, I, like, I think it's in July, August of 2025. And I'll have that on my website soon also. And now is it mostly photographers or it can be people that are just hobbyists? Or it's, it's mainly photographers. photographers. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're going to be there specifically to photograph. We'll be on a boat uh, and we'll be going from island to island and island, sleeping on the boat, eating on the boat, going into the islands during the day. And then um, overnight, they'll be motoring to the next island. And then, uh, you know, so every morning you get up into a new island and uh, uh, tour around the Galapagos Islands. Mm -hmm. Are you going to use that camp, the underwater camera for those? Uh, oh, you bet. Iguanas, the marine iguanas. <laughs> you bet. Yeah, yeah the have, marine iguanas They have are like amazing. a third eye or they have something great. Like they've got some weird. Yeah, uh, for, for yeah. light sensing. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Um, let's see, you do have a question here from Patty who says, Stan, have you uh, photographed the monarch migration in Mexico? I have not, but I've done it in California. <laughs> mm. uh, um, that would be a bucket list trip for me uh, to see that uh, our monarchs are, you, you want an amazing, you know, critter. They kind of fit the hummingbird. They're so small and so, but they do, they're so mighty and they do so many amazing things. And the monarchs are the same way. And we're talking about an insect here that, for some reason, knows that every fifth generation migrates down to Mexico to overwinter to repopulate for the next following year. Now, of course, the plight of the monarch is not doing very well right now, and the populations are down dramatically. But what an amazing insect, uh, one that feeds on a plant that has toxic properties in the plant and then is able to take those toxic properties and uh, wall them off in their own body. And, uh, and basically, they're finding a food source that no other insects are. And I, that, is, that is one of those most amazing things. Um, and we're talking about an insect, you know, something that we don't really give much thought to. And we usually just squish them and things like that. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm talking about? And it's just... I'm always amazed by that type of stuff. The, I guess I never lost my sense of wonder from when I was a childhood. Um, it is, it is really a, it, it's one of those kind of amazing. Uh, I keep saying amazing. I apologize for that, but it's, uh, it truly is a remarkable insect that uh, migrates again, you know, thousands of miles down to Mexico and then returns back up. Uh, doesn't make it all the way back up, of course, but it returns back to be able to repopulate and send more mic you know monarchs back up into the United States. So that's like that's one of those animals where it's like when you're talking about how we try to come up with reasons why things do what they do, or it's yep. yeah, like how does it know? Like you said, every fifth generation to <laughs> to start that migration, it's insane. Mm -hmm. um, Douglas has a question here for you. What are your best suggestions for finding snowy owls? Do you shoot in RAW or JPEG, Canon or Nikon? Uh, so I also answered in the comments myself. Um, but uh, the snowy owls, you got to go to Canada for them. You got to go north. Uh, that's the main thing. Um, and even, you know, just north of New York into up into Canada is where you need to go. I only shoot in RAW. That's all there is to it. And I've been photographing Canon for uh, with Canon equipment for 40 years. So I don't. I don't see myself changing anytime soon. Perfect. I love oh, Canon. <laughs> you love Canon, Canon yeah. guy. Yeah. That might be everybody's questions. We can do the uh, drawing here for the book. Too. Yeah, my post didn't go, go through. It says the comment has failed to post to the birdhouse. Oh, hmm. I wonder why. The, That's okay. Uh, I just answered it anyhow, so no big deal. Answer. Yeah. All right. So we've got some entries here for our book drawing. So, um, we'll see. Oh my, look at that. Who wins? Oh, it can't be the birdhouse. So they must have taken mine as the, uh, <laughs> as the thing. So we'll do it again. You're going to win. You just won. <laughs> It's rigged. <laughs> 
it looks like um, you've got another question too while we redo this. Um, there's, has Stan photographed any of the winter migrant eagles in Arkansas or Oklahoma? So this is an interesting thing and not, uh, you know, not 20, 30 years ago, you could not find large concentrations of eagles. <laughs> Excuse me, and now you do. Uh, they have come back so well in population. And so we have uh, these pockets of areas where the eagles will gather in the winter time and i go to iowa believe it or not which is uh just south of minnesota uh where the uh eagles will uh gather there too and then in february i'm going to alaska for bald eagles and um uh, so you can go to a variety of different places around and there's some really great spots to uh, to be able to photograph eagles that's for sure do you ever do the sandhill crane migration? Do yes. you ever go out there to is it Nebraska? In Nebraska, like, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah. So I, I led trips there for thirty years, and um, every spring, and then I I'm now retiring from the nature center, so I'm not uh, leading those trips anymore. But coming this March, I will be back. I'll be leading a private tour down there uh, to see the sandhill cranes. And then I plan on offering some photography tours down to Nebraska, uh, also in the future. Awesome. Awesome. So let's see, it looks like we have our winner. Our actual winner is Lynn. Just won a signed copy of one of your newest books, Owls, the Majestic Hunters. Congratulations, Lynn. Um, it looks like you might've gotten, oh, okay. Uh, there's a question mm -hmm. slash comment here about, fishing at a lake dam in Oklahoma. Do you yes. do any fishing? I don't personally fish. Um, I have a hard time killing anything uh, <laughs> personally, but um, so uh, I don't, but uh, like that picture I sent you with the eagle uh, fishing, that is the type of stuff that uh, I do when we go to Alaska and, uh, and photograph there. It is absolutely exquisite. <laughs> the types of images you can get are just off the hook. Crazy. Um, and they're pulling fish out of the ocean and all that is it's wow it's an amazing thing and so it looks like that's about everybody's comments and questions for the day i want to thank you and say, wish you a happy birthday first oh, of all yes happy very happy birthday um and we can all look forward to stan even coming up to the rochester area next year so make sure you mark your calendars Friday, April 12th, he'll be giving his talk about owls here. And we hope to have a couple other events with him as well while we've got him here in town. So um, we'll be handing out flyers about that and make sure to mark it on your calendar. And um, do you have any uh, any parting words for us? Anything you want to promote no. or anything like that? Well, uh, of course, I, I have a lot of children's books. So if you've got a... Uh... Uh, a kind of a small kid in your life who needs a holiday gift, uh, go to naturesmart.com and you can, yep, there's who's but. I have a variety of different things, but if you go to uh, naturesmart.com, click on the bookstore, you'll have an option to either buy directly from the publisher or from Amazon, it doesn't matter to me, and or buy from your local bookstores or buy from the, the birdhouse here. This is the best thing to do. And uh, what I can say about my children's books are is they're accurate. They're mm -hmm. not made up. They're not you know, they don't have um, false information in them. As a wildlife biologist, I insist on the things being correct. And so uh, what, with my books, you're going to be teaching and entertaining at the same time. Yeah, we've got a lot of fun ones. Mm -hmm. Like, Of course, Who's Butt is like the bestseller. Yeah. We've got you know, What Eats That, talking about food chains. This is my go-to book for anybody having a yes. baby or baby shower. C is for Cardinal. That's like yeah. everybody I know has <laughs> gotten this for me. Yeah. And then, honestly, our best-selling book in the whole store is consistently, ever since I've started here, has been Birds of New York. And you've, you're on your third edition, I believe it is, of this now. Yes. So it's all yeah. up to date with new range maps and expanded, um, you know, a and, little bit expanded. Yeah, and we'll be changing names here in the next coming year. Oh, no... that's right. That's right. you got to get of, all those names lots, correct. Yeah. Lots of name changes coming up here. Yeah. <laughs> what is, yeah. what an right. interesting thing there. Um I don't know if anybody's, if people haven't heard about this, uh, the uh, AOU, the American Ornithologist uh, uh, Society, is going to be changing the common names of upwards of 200 some birds um, and that were named after people. And um, so some of these people that these birds were named after were named by, uh, uh, what do we want to say, uh, people with questionable backgrounds. And what they've decided to do is to change it 
not only for questionable background people, but all people that the bird's been named after. So slippery slope. Yeah. <laughs> so just as you thought you got, you had all your bird names down. It's time to relearn them. It's gonna, it's gonna change. <laughs> yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again for joining us. And I'm sure we'll talk soon. We have a huge selection of your books here at the birdhouse that you can always stop in and take a look. We'll be in touch with Lynn who won a signed copy of your owls book that's exciting it's very exciting and um you'll have your chance to meet stan and see him in person here in rochester in april which will be here before we know it so liz, i'm you. so looking forward to that liz and hopefully everybody will come out and see me on the uh, next year april april 12th was it april 12th yep yep it's um, going to be a friday night i'm so. looking forward to it yeah. So thank you for, for taking your time to give us a little update about what you've been doing. Congratulations on your upcoming retirement, even Yay. though retirement, retirement from the nature center. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah, not retirement from books and trips. No, and no. Stuff, so. Awesome. So we'll be in touch and thank you everybody for tuning in today and we'll do another live broadcast. We'll be back on Saturday with another live broadcast here. And until then, we'll talk to you later and you guys have a great week. Take Bye, care. Everybody. Thanks, Thanks Liz. Bye-bye.